So I'll just copy that off and we'll go through and we'll read this through so you can get used to how you'd read a textbook, um, how you'd read some mathematical instruction and be able to figure it out. Because um, it's, it's fairly technical writing and it's important that you be able to do that. So, um, uh, you can write on this, you can make notes here. I copied off everything but the last page. Um, I'll, I'll show you that on here. And then we're going to run through and I'm going to do some problems. If I don't get done today, I think what I'll do is I'll probably record a video and you can watch that in class tomorrow. So tomorrow, these, these don't have sound unless you have a, a, you know, earbuds or headphones or something like that. So if tomorrow, if you bring earbuds or headphones so you can watch that. I don't think it's going to take very long. I think we can get most of this done today. But it would be really nice if tomorrow, since it's before a, a long weekend, um, if we maybe had some time in class to work. I'd like to talk to everybody individually and just talk to you about how things are going at this point. So that's why I'd like to do that. Um, but here's how we're going to handle this. Again, this is just a copy of what's in your textbook. I'd like to read, um, and we'll kind of go around. And there's a microphone up here that will catch everybody what people are saying as long as you talk really loud. So I'm just going to go around. We'll call on people uh, to read this. And I'll point out the important parts of this. Um, and it's important when you go through and read a math textbook, I mean, you should read it kind of slowly and you should make sure you think about what's going on and what they're saying. See if you can put the pieces together here. So this section is on polynomial functions of higher degree. Okay? We've dealt with linear functions. Okay? If it's y equals mx plus b or something like that, there's just a plain old x. That's a degree one polynomial. Those are pretty easy to work with. We're familiar with those. And if I have y equals ax squared plus bx plus c, that's a quadratic. That's a polynomial. We talked about that yesterday, and we've studied that quite a bit already in this course. Okay? If it's a degree higher than that, like a degree 3 or degree 4 or degree 5, it's a little bit more complicated. And that's what we're going to learn about today. Not really that difficult, just more things to keep track of. Okay? So, Tony, would you read that first paragraph nice and loud, please? Okay, so the key word there to pick up on is continuous. And if we say something is continuous, that, mean, that means it has no breaks, no holes, no gaps, anything like that. Basically, you can draw the whole thing from one end to the other without picking up your pencil. Draw the whole thing from one end to the other without picking up your pencil. So this is a continuous graph. This isn't a continuous graph because I've got to pick up my pencil. And even if it were something like this, as simple as a straight line with a hole in it, I can't draw that line without stopping right there, picking up, and then drawing the rest of the line on the other side of that little hole. Okay? Uh, let's see. Noah, would you read that next paragraph? Okay, this paragraph describes why we like polynomials so much. They're nice. They have nice, smooth graphs. Nothing weird happens with them. We don't have any corners or anything like that. Okay? They're just nice, smooth, flowing, continuous graphs. Okay? Um, so very nice to work with. In fact, in my calculus class next week, we're actually going to be studying more about polynomials. We're going to use calculus to come up with graphs of polynomials. Okay? And one of the things we nice is we like is they're nice, they're smooth, they're continuous, they're just kind of these flowing graphs, and they have some nice general behavior. Okay? So it can kind of wiggle around here, but it's got this nice, smooth, flowing uh, turning points and stuff like that. Okay, so uh, let's see. Lynn, would you read uh, this next paragraph, please? Okay, so key word there, by hand. Okay, we want to be able to sketch these by hand. We realize a calculator could produce these. 
but sometimes calculators will hide some of the important behavior, so we want to be able to do these by hand. Okay? Remember, a degree zero is just a horizontal line. That would just be y equals a number, because that would be x to the zero power. Okay? So we're talking about horizontal lines, lines that are slanted, and parabolas. That's what we've covered so far. We're interested in things that are a bit more complicated than that, um, because they'd probably have more applications in real life. Notice that we'd want to use some symmetry, we'd want to plot some points, maybe use some intercepts and stuff like that. And then we want a reasonably accurate sketch. We're not talking about a perfect sketch, we're just talking about something that's reasonably accurate. It shows all the important features. Okay? Uh, let's see, Jordan, will you read that next paragraph? <laughs> You know, we talked about this just a little bit, I think. Okay, so um, one of the keys here is we're talking about monomials, and a lot of times, if we have something of this form, okay, we call that a power function. Okay, call that a power function. And remember, it says it's similar to the graph of x squared, but not exactly like x squared. So what happens when we raise the power, so if we go from x squared to x to the fourth, it still has a similar shape, meaning it starts up here and ends up here as we go from left to right. But it gets steeper and it gets flatter in the middle. So if I were to do something like, say I did x to the eighth here, x to the eighth would be really steep, and then really flat in between here, okay? It would look something like that. But again, all of these, if they have an even power, they start up here and they end up here. If they're an odd power, they start down here and they end up here, okay? When it's odd, it's going to start down here and end up here. And if I were to do something like x to the seventh, okay, it's going to be very steep. It's going to go through one, or excuse me, negative one, one flatten out in between here, not be completely flat, but pretty darn close, and then it's just going to be steeper and steeper and steeper, okay? Now, the, this book uses a different way of describing this than I do, um, but I usually say that even ones start up here and end up here, and odd ones start down here and end up here, okay? And then they talk about some transformations here, so let's take a look at uh, these uh, sketches right here. If I have negative x to the fifth, that negative is a vertical flip. So x to the fifth normally looks like this. It starts down here and ends up here. Multiplying it by a negative vertically flips it. So it starts up here and ends down here. It's the same shape. It's just been vertically flipped. And just like normal, if I take the x and I add something to it, before I, in this case, raise it to the fourth power to make the shape, it's still going to look like x to the fourth. It's still going to start up here and end up here. The difference is we're going to take the graph and we're going to move it to the left one unit. Okay? So we could sketch it using those transformations. Again, we talked about those in the last chapter. Any questions there? Okay, let's see. We were on page uh, 214. Find page 215. It's easier to look at the numbers than figure out how those are stapled and folded. Okay? So the cool part about this is we can use what's called the leading coefficient test. Even with really long, complicated polynomials, we can use the leading coefficient to figure out roughly what it looks like. Okay? So Raymond, will you read that uh, paragraph at the top there? Okay, so here's the leading coefficient test, and here's what they say here. They say it eventually rises or falls. So what they mean by that is it eventually, as you're going to the left or the right, it eventually goes up or it goes down. I like using that terminology there. So if n is odd, most of the time, if a is, if a is positive, so a positive, okay, it's going to start down here and it's going to end up here. Notice that they've got this dotted line right in here, or this dotted curve. 
We may not be exactly sure what happens in there. We've got to do a little bit more investigation to find that. But we know that if A is positive, it starts down here and it ends up here. If A is negative, then that's a vertical flip. It's going to start up here and eventually it's going to end down here. Okay? Just like we saw in that x to the fifth that had a negative in front of it. So all you need is the leading coefficient and you'll be able to tell a lot about what the shape is. If we take a look at one that's even, so if we had like x to the 18th or something like that, okay? because it's even, it's going to start up here and it's also going to end up here. In between, it can have a whole bunch of wiggles in it. They're going to be nice, smooth, gradual turns and stuff like that. But it's always going to start up here and end up here as long as A is positive. If A is negative, then that's just a vertical flip. So it's going to flip it upside down. So it's going to start down here, and it's going to end down here. In between, maybe it just has one gentle curve to it. Maybe it's got a couple that go something like this. Okay? So that's why that dotted line is there, is in there, because the leading coefficient test will only tell us what happens when we get out toward the ends. Okay? Does it start down here and end up here? Or does it start, start, start up here, end down here, and that sort of thing? Okay? So if we were to take a look in the margins right here, all, I, all we'd be interested in at this point, and you could throw every one of these into the calculator, and I would like you to do that later on, but let's take a look at this right here. The first thing we want to do is we want to make sure that each one of these is, is in descending order. They put every one of these in descending order for us. Okay? What is the most dominant term? Which of these terms tells us roughly what it's shaped like? It's the leading one right there. So this looks like x cubed. So a little sketch for this would be something like that. It's got to start down here and it's got to end up here. What if it was x to the fifth with a positive 2 in front of it? Same type of thing. Got to start down here and end up here. What about negative x, negative 2x to the fifth? Start up here and end down here, right? And negative x to the third? Start up here and end down here. What about 2x squared? That ought to be easy, isn't it? So we know the shape exactly. It's a parabola, right? And it opens up, so it looks something like that. What about positive x to the fourth? Opens up. Maybe it's got some wiggles in there. Maybe it gets really flat, but it starts up here and ends up here. And x squared, clearly that would be a parabola. It's going to open up. Okay? Any questions there? Okay. So find page 216, and it talks about applying the leading coefficient test. So let's take a look at that. It says, describe the left-hand and right-hand behavior of this graph right here. Again, it's just looking at it and applying this idea right here. Let me see if we didn't skip anything, did we? Nope, didn't skip anything, okay? So all we're interested in is we don't know exactly what this graph looks like, but we can tell that it starts up here and it ends down here because it has a negative in front of the x cubed. x cubed normally looks like this. If you multiply it by a negative, it's got to look something like that, okay? Now, whether it has some nice curves here to it or not doesn't really matter at this point. We're interested in the fact that it starts up here and ends down here. And when I say ends, remember it's just continuing on in that direction, so there'd be arrows on it. Any questions there? Okay. Uh, let's see. Tammy, would you read this paragraph right there? Okay. So, Again, it's just pointing out that eventually we're describing what it's doing. What's it doing out near the ends as we go toward negative infinity or positive infinity? And the next example right here, again, all we need to look at is x to the fourth. It starts off with that, so it's going to start up here and it's going to end up here. Maybe have some wiggles in between. And there's an x to the fifth. Does something like that. Any questions or is that pretty easy? Okay. Odd. It's going to start and end in different places. It's going to do something like this. Even, it's going to start up here and end up here, or start down here and end down here. So kind of a funny S-shape for odds, okay? Kind of a U-shape of, of sorts for evens, okay? All right, so now let's talk about zeros of a polynomial function. Peyton, would you read that first paragraph there? 
We're on page 217. Find page 217. Yep. Uh, no, just read that remember. Okay, now, but, now, pretend like you're reading this on your own and you really want to understand it. If you didn't get that little paragraph, it only has, what, two sentences in it? In it let's stop and think about what it says. Okay, it can be shown for a polynomial f of degree n, the following statements are true. Okay, so they're not going to show us. We're going to take those for granted for right now. Okay, they're going to show us some statements that we know are true about polynomials of degree n. So an example of a polynomial of degree n would be degree 5, blah, 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 degree 4, blah, 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 and stuff like that. So we've got a polynomial that starts off with a certain degree. Okay? And it says, remember that zeros of a function are the x values for which the function is equal to 0. They're the x-intercepts, or the solutions, or the roots, or the zeros, like we've been talking about. Okay? So the first one. Um, Hope, would you read that first one? Okay, so n minus 1 turning points. Okay, that seems a little bit weird. And then it goes on to describe what a turning point is. A turning point are points at which the graph changes from increasing to decreasing or vice versa. So what it means is it changes from going like this, increasing, and then decreasing, and then increasing, and then decreasing, and something like that. That is a turning point, kind of a peak. That is a turning point, kind of a trough. So how many turning points are there right here demonstrated? Four of them, okay? So here's what it says. If you know the degree of the polynomial, I'm going to call these TPs, turning points, okay? It has at most n minus 1 turning points. So whatever the degree is, you take the degree and you subtract 1, and that will tell you how many turning points it can have, up to that many. So if it's degree 5, it can have up to how many turning points? Up to 4 turning points. What if it's degree 3? Up to 3 turning points. Okay? So take the degree. It's always one degree less. Now, does that mean it has to have that many turning points? No, it doesn't. If it's plain old degree 5, if we just had f of x equals x to the fifth, remember what that looks like. It comes up like this, flattens off for a second, and then goes like that. Does that turn around? Does it have a peak? It doesn't. Okay? So it means it can have up to that many turning points. It just can't have more than that many turning points. Okay? And then the next statement. Nathan, would you read that one? And we will study this in 2.5, and that will be on the next exam. Okay, what does it mean, stop and think for a second, what does it mean if f has a zero? What does that mean on the graph? What is it, Logan? It means it's an x-intercept. So if you have a degree 5 polynomial, how many real zeros, how many x-intercepts can it have? Up to 5. Okay, so up to five zeros, up to five x-intercepts. It can cross the x-axis in five places. Okay? What if it's degree four? Up to four zeros. Okay? Now, we're talking real zeros, and we'll find out what we mean, why we have to quantify that and say, or qualify that and say they have to be real zeros. Okay? So, Next statement there. Uh, let's see, Brandon, will you read that one? Very good. Okay, so finding the zeros of a polynomial is one of the most important problems in algebra. Okay, 
in on every one of the tests that we've had, we've had problems where we've been finding zeros of particular functions or particular equations. That is a big deal. Finding zeros does not go away. Okay. In my calculus class next week, we will be finding a bunch of zeros and they're going to be hating life because they will have forgotten how to factor and, and all sorts of stuff. Okay. Finding zeros is a very big deal. Okay. And it says sometimes we can use the information about the graph, so we can use the graph to find the zeros. And in other cases, you can use the zeros to help sketch its graph. So it goes both ways. Okay. There's a very strong relationship between the zeros, where it crosses the x-axis, and what the shape of the graph is. And if you know the shape of the graph, you can also figure out the zero. So it goes both directions. Okay. And in this next box, it says, it has a statement about real zeros, and it says, all of these are equivalent statements. And we've actually talked about this before, and hopefully this sounds familiar. If I say x equals a is a zero of a function, that's another way of saying it's an intercept. So if I say I've got a zero, I've told you that I've got an x-intercept at that particular point. So if a is a zero, that is the x-intercept. A is the coordinate on the x-axis. Y is the y equal to zero. Noah? Yeah, because the x-axis is where y is equal to zero. You didn't go up or down, right? Okay, and that's why they call it a zero. Because when you plug it in, the function value is zero, or the y-coordinate is zero. Okay, And then it says x equals a is a solution to this equation. When does the, gra when does the function equal, to, equal zero? And it also means that x minus a is a factor. So if I told you that 7 is a zero, x minus 7 is a factor. If I told you negative 3 is a zero, what factor would that correspond to? X minus minus 3, so that would be plus 3. Does that make sense? So if you know the zeros, you can find the factors. If you have the factors, you can find the zeros. Okay, so let's take a look at this next example, example number 4. It says, find all the real zeros. Use the graph in figure 2.15 to determine the number of turning points for the graph of the function. So let's do the easy part first. It says, look at the graph and figure out how many turning points. How many turning points? Three. Does that make sense, given the, the fact that it's degree four? What if we went through here and we had something like this? What if it did this? One, two. What if it did that? Could this be, this red addition that I've made to this, could that be the graph of negative 2x to the fourth? It couldn't, because how many turning points? One, two, three, four, five. Okay? Wouldn't work. Okay? It's degree four. You can only have one less than that as far as turning points goes. Okay, so here's what we do in this case. We've answered the question about turning points. We've seen that that matches up. If we were going to find the zeros, and they do start off with relatively simple ones like this, let's go ahead and factor this. We've actually done problems like this before. So I'm going to take this and I'm going to factor it. Notice we're going to take out the leading coefficient and the leading sign. They both have a 2, and I'm going to take out the negative. They both have an x squared, so I take out an x squared. And then I've got x squared minus 1 left. Am I, am I done factoring when I've, if I've got an x squared minus 1? Nope, this has a name. What's this called? Difference of squares. So we factored it to there's the negative uh, 2x squared, there's x minus 1, and there's x plus 1. What is the 0 that comes from this one right here? Negative 1. And how about this one? Positive 1. And how about this one right here? 0. Okay? So the zeros on this are... Um, I'll put them in order. Negative 1, 0, and 1. Okay? And that's what the graph looks like. Okay? Now, I'm, I think you've got some room down at the bottom of this page right here, don't you? You've got some space? Okay. Uh, let's see. Alexis, would you read that last paragraph there that starts off with, says, example 4? Thank you. 
Okay, very well done. Um, I think Alexis got uh, the toughest paragraph to read in here. That is very wordy, okay? It's at the bottom of a page. There are a couple of bold things at the top of the page, but um, occasionally an author of a textbook will maybe not draw enough attention uh, to something. This paragraph right here contains probably some of the biggest ideas in this section if we were going to take zeros and produce a graph, okay? That leading coefficient test, very important. Knowing that if it's odd, it does this. If it's even, it does that and stuff like that. All very important, but this probably contains the next most important stuff, and it's at the bottom of the page, and there's hardly anything in there that's bolded. Okay? So we want to make sure we understand what's going on here. Okay? This is called a repeated zero, because if I broke it up, I'd have x times x. I'd have a zero from this first x, and I'd have a zero from that x. Okay? Um, if we have a zero that occurs more than once, so in other words, if it has a power on that factor, like this one does here, it's x raised to the second, then we say that zero has a multiplicity, okay? And the cool part about this is, if you know the multiplicity, you know what the, what the graph does at that x-intercept. You know how it behaves, and the behavior can be it either touches or it crosses, okay? So, for this problem right here, I'm going to write down the multiplicity. So, I've got the zeros listed right here. Let's look at each one of these. So, for negative 1, okay, this is the factor that produced a zero of negative 1. What's the exponent sitting right here that's not written? It's a 1. So, its multiplicity is 1. Okay, let's find the one that produced the zero. It's right here. What's the exponent on that factor? 2, so its multiplicity is 2. Okay, find the one that produced the 0 of 1. Its multiplicity is 1. Everybody good with that? Okay, now I'm going to write T or C. This stands for touch or cross. Okay, and here's what this paragraph says. If it's odd multiplicity, it crosses through there at that point. If it's even, it touches. So, this is odd, does it touch or cross? Crosses. This is even, touch or cross? Touch. This is odd, so it crosses. So, let's come back up here and let's identify these right here. There's our 0 of negative 1. Here's our 0 of 0, and here's our 0 of positive 1. Okay, take a look at the leading coefficient. It looks like negative 2x to the 4th. That means it starts down here, probably wiggles around a couple times and goes like that, right? So if I start down here, what does it do when I get to negative 1? It crosses, okay? Then at some point, it's going to have to turn around in order to hit this point right here. Does it cross through it or does it touch it? It touches it, okay? That's why it does that shape like it does. It's got to turn around so it can hit this one, and then it continues going like that. So it can start down here and end down here, just like we know negative 2x to the fourth does. Are there any questions there? Okay, zeros, their multiplicity, and whether it touches or crosses at each one of those points, those are important. Okay, I would know those. Any questions? Yeah. Um, it's, it's whatever the exponent is on the factor that produced that zero. So if I were to just go through, I'd write down the 0 here is 0, the 0 here is 1, and the 0 here is negative 1. And then the multiplicity is exactly the same as whatever the exponent is. Okay? It's that simple. Okay, anything else? Okay, find page 218. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to run through some of the examples in the book. Um, so it says, sketch this graph. So let's stop and think about this. What is this going to look like? Which of these terms is the most important? The 3x to the 4. Okay? Which means it's going to start up here and it's going to end up here. How many turning points can it have? Up to 3. Okay? So maybe it does something like uh, this. Okay? Some sort of funky W shape. Could it look like this? It could. It doesn't have to have three turning points, but it could have up to three turning points. Okay? 
The next thing they say is find the zeros of the polynomial. So let's factor these out. You factor out an x to the third, you're left with 3x minus 4. Okay, I'm going to uh, increase the size here for a second. What's the zero here? Zero. What's the zero here? Positive 4 thirds, right? Okay, um, what's the multiplicity? Multiplicity is 3. What's the multiplicity here? 1. Since these are both odd, what does it do at each one of those? It's going to cross, okay? Now, I'm going to make this a little bit smaller, and we're going to take a look at what they did. It says, plot a couple of additional points. So here's what they mean by this, okay? Remember, we said it's going to start up here, and it's going to end up here. And it's got to cross through here and cross through here. Now, try and avert your eyes. Don't look at this one for just a second, okay? It's got to start up here, and when we get to this point right here, it's got to cross through. And then in order to hit this one, it's got to turn back around, and it's got to cross through. Does that have us heading in the right direction? It does. Okay. If you labeled these points right here, I would consider that a fairly complete graph. Okay. Now, what they do, and what people typically will say when they're doing this, is they'll say, well, I'm used to drawing things that are really accurate. We know a lot about parabolas. We can draw really accurate parabolas, and we can draw really accurate, accurate lines. Okay. So people will say, well, how do I know how far down it goes? Maybe my friend drew it like that. Okay. Or maybe my other friend drew it like this. How do you know which one it is? Okay. It is not terribly important. If we want to draw a rough sketch, if you want to pick a point over here and graph it, if you want to pick a point over here and graph it, plug in a point and figure out you know, where it is. So on this one, they plugged in a negative 1, and they got out a 7. So the point 1, 7 is on the graph. It might be a good idea, if there's a nice value that you can plug in, like they plugged in 1, and it looks like they got out a negative 1. I'm not sure, though, because we didn't plug it in. Let's check and see. If you plug in a 1, you get out a negative 1. Okay? Now, would you be interested in plugging in 0.5 and 1.5, especially if you didn't have a calculator? No. Okay? So let me tell you why I think this isn't terribly important. Adding one other point, yeah, that's okay. Maybe this curves around like this, like changes from curving this way to kind of curving downward or something like that. Not terribly important, and you need, need some calculus in order to figure out exactly what uh, is going on there. Okay? One danger of this is, doesn't it look like there's a minimum right there? They made it look like there's a minimum there. Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. We'd need something much more complicated in order to figure that out. Okay? So, I would consider this, get rid of these guys right here, I would consider that a good sketch. If you want to add one or two more points, that's fine with me. Okay? But I don't expect a bunch of them. Okay? Now, one thing that we want to point out is this right here. Uh, Miranda, would you read that last paragraph there? Okay. When they write a paragraph like this and they're trying to point out some common mistakes or some things that you definitely need to do, they emphasize that it's got to be in standard form. And what they're saying here is, don't screw this up. If you write that in the wrong order and just look at it and say, oh, it looks like negative 4x to the third, you're done. You can do everything else right, but you are go you're going to have completely the wrong shape. So please make sure it's in standard form. Make sure it's in descending order so that you can identify what's the degree of the polynomial, what's the highest degree, and then what's the overall shape depending on whatever that number is in front there. Okay? So find page 219. And again, I'd like you to avert your eyes for just a second. Look up here. We're looking at this guy right here. You want to think about what does this look like. So it looks like whoop, looks like what? What's the most important thing here? 
this guy right here. And you can grab that first one because it's already in descending order. Okay, so it looks like this right here. How many turning points can it have? Up to two turning points. Roughly, what does it look like? If it's a if it's an odd degree and it has a negative in front, does it start down and end up like this, or does it start up and end down like that? Starts up and ends down, right? So it's probably going to look something like this right here. That's what we're looking for in the overall shape. Okay. Any questions there? Okay, the next thing that we'd want to do is we want to find those zeros and their multiplicity. So t let's take a good look at this right here. How would I factor that? What's the first rule in factoring? Take out the greatest common factor. Okay, now it doesn't really look like they have a greatest common factor, but if I were to take out, let's say I take out, I really don't like that one half there. Let's take out a negative one half. And don't they all have an x? So if I take out the negative and a half, what happens if I take a half out of this? Yep, ends up multiplying it by 2. So that's 4x squared. What happens if I take a negative 1 half out of this? Changes sign, so it's, whoops, that should be a squared. Changes sign, so it's a negative, And I double it, so that's going to be negative 12. And I've got 1x left. I took the x out, I took the negative out, I took the half out. What's left? Positive 9. Okay. Now, take a good look at this. I realize the answer's down below, but if you had to do this on your own, look at it. How does that factor? This has a name. Anybody remember what it is? Perfect trinomial square. That's a perfect square of 2x. That's a perfect square of 3. If you multiply them together and double it, that's the right middle term. So this is going to be 2x and 3, quantity squared, plus or minus in between here. It's going to be a minus, and then I've got the negative 1 half out front here. Any questions there? What is the 0 that comes from this one right here? 0. What's its multiplicity? 1. There's a 1 on there. We don't normally write it. Okay. And is it going to touch or cross? Cross. Okay. What's the zero that comes from here? Positive three halves. What's its multiplicity? Two. Touch or cross? Touch. Okay. Now I'm going to bring this back, and we've actually talked about most of this. Again, plotting a couple of additional points. You can do that if you want, but let's take a look here. Actually, let me slide this up here. Okay. Um, it has a zero at zero and a zero at three halves, and let's see, what did we say it looks like? It's got to start up here, and it's got to end down here. So when we come to this point, does it, and ve listen very carefully, a lot of people, uh, this one happens to be written in the right order, they'll come to this first one, and they'll immediately looking at, look at this one instead of looking up above and finding the zero. So here's how you want to do this. We're approaching zero, find zero, does it touch or cross? Crosses. So it's going to cross through. And then we've got to come back up and we've got to hit this one. So we've got to turn around. And when I hit this one, so find the zero, it's three halves, one and a half. Does it touch or cross? It touches. So it goes like that. Okay. If you label these points, I would consider that a complete graph. Now, if it has a y-intercept other than zero, if it doesn't cross at the origin, I definitely want to find the y-intercept because those are pretty easy to find. Okay. But compare our sketch with their sketch. How does it look? Looks pretty good, right? Any questions? Okay. Um, I'm going to ask somebody tomorrow. Can, I, I would like to know if you can come up with a good reason why if it's even, it touches, and why if it's odd, it crosses. It's not a hard thing if you think about it. And if somebody gets it, and we can talk about this tomorrow, you'll go, oh, of course, that makes sense as to why it would do that. Okay? All right. So uh, flip to that last page. It's on the intermediate value theorem. Okay? And in the interest of time, I'm just going to tell you what this is. Okay? The intermediate value theorem is, we could also call it the middle values theorem. Oops, middle values theorem. 
Okay, and here's what this says. If I've got a nice, smooth, connected graph like a polynomial, okay, and it's, it's pretty wordy, if A and B are real numbers, so that B is bigger than A, so in other words, you're going from left to right, and we've got a polynomial, so that these two function values are not equal, so these two are in different places, one's bigger than the other, doesn't really matter which one. It says, on the interval from A to B, so as we go from A to B, f of x takes on all of the values in between here and here. So as x goes from here to here, y goes from here to here, and it covers every single value in between. So let me give you an example. If this is 5 and this is 10, and this is 14 and this is 20, as I plug along here and I plug in all the numbers between 5 and 10, I would get all of the function values between 14 and 20. Every single one of them. I wouldn't be able to skip any because remember, there are no holes or gaps in these types of graphs. Okay? That's all it means. If you cover all the values in between here in the middle of 5 and 10, you're going to cover all, cover all of the function values between 14 and 20 in the middle of 14 and 20. That's why we call it the middle values theorem or the intermediate value theorem. Does that make sense? Okay. So the reason this is important is because we use this to find the roots or the zeros of functions. So if I have a value right here that's positive, and I have a value right here that's negative, is there any way to go from a negative value here to a positive value here and not cross through zero? What's in the middle of the negatives and positives? Zero. So if I go from a positive value down to a negative value, somewhere in between I've got to cross zero because zero is in the middle or intermediate between the negatives and positives. Okay? Does that make sense? It's a pretty simple idea. Now the page I didn't copy off um, was the last one, and you can look at it in your book. Okay? It says, use the intermediate value theorem to approximate the real zeros. Okay? So this is what they do they figure out roughly what it looks like. So they sketch the graph, and it happens to have a negative value right here at negative 1, and it has a positive value right here at 0. So in between negative 1 and 0, it goes from being negative to having positive function values. Well, what's got to happen somewhere in between negative 1 and 0? It's got to cross through the x-axis, right? Okay? And then they do something else that you may have done on your calculator. They say, well, wait a minute. What if the function value is positive at one half? At, sorry, at negative one half, at negative 0.5. So in between negative one and negative one half, it goes from being negative to being positive. What do you know has to happen in between negative one half and negative one? Got to cross through zero. And then what if they say, well, how about this point right here is point negative 0.8? And this point right here is negative 0.7. And let's say it's positive here and negative here. What has to happen in between negative 0.8 and negative 0.7? It's got to cross the x-axis, so it's got to have a 0. If we were that close, what would we guess the 0 is? About negative 0.75? Okay. So we kind of just zoom in and zoom in and zoom in and narrow in and narrow in and narrow in. So we've got a point above and a point below, and we say, well, it's got to cross somewhere in between there. Okay? All right. Any questions? Okay. Um, that actually finishes the section. Um, I would finish reading that, um, and I would look at the stuff in the margins. Your job tonight is to get done with 2.1 and reread those notes for yourself. Okay? Tomorrow in class we'll finish this. I'll show you how to do the problems in 2.2 and you'll have some time to work. Hopefully you can get most of it. We'll correct 2.1 and hopefully you can have most of 2.2 done by the time you leave. Or at least have a very good head start on it and then have a nice weekend. Okay? Any questions? Okay, thanks.